So thank you all for joining us again. Uh, it turns out now it's a beautiful day, so I hope you're all having a chance to go outside and wonder at the glory of the snow-clad flat irons. Um, I have the pleasure of monitoring our second panel on the shapes of transparency. And in some ways, uh, with no offense to the first or the third panel, it's my favorite, um, because this is where we're really gonna dive down into the nitty gritty details of variations in how transparency might be designed. So when I think about this from a legal scholar's perspective, I'm interested in hearing, you know, what shapes of transparency are best suited for what purposes, right? We heard from the first panel uh, that it's really important to identify why it is you wanna use transparency in the first place. This is the panel where we get to hear well, once you know that reason, what's your method um, and what's your process and what's your enforcement? So I have the pleasure uh, of introducing our panelists and I'm gonna do the introduction in alphabetical order, but then they're seated by the order in which I'm asking them questions. Um, so you're gonna have to sort of visually jump around and maybe you can raise your hand when I introduce you. Um, and then the other thing I'm gonna say is gonna be a little different from the format of the first panel is that I would love to hear our panelists jump in after each person presents. So uh, these are informal presentations, as you know, um, but once one of you answers a question, if somebody else has a follow-on thought, absolutely feel free to add that follow-on thought before we go on to the next panelist. All right, so um, way over on the other side there, we have Jeff Auslis, who is a senior researcher and data protection, uh, for those of you who are not European, that means data privacy, expert from the University of Amsterdam. Right next to me, uh, is Rachel Johnson, who is a local legal initiative attorney for the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press. Uh, back at the very other end of the panel, we have Andrea, um, who is a former student of mine, so I'm extremely proud to have her on this panel. Uh, and she practices data privacy law, including counseling companies on the kinds of transparency requests I've referenced throughout the day, subject access requests. Then we have uh, right in the middle, Brian, who is an associate professor and the associate chair of undergrad studies at the Department of Information Science here at CU. And finally, Amanda Shainer is an associate professor of legal studies and business, business ethics at Wharton. All right, so we're gonna start today with a conversation with the open government litigator, Rachel, who is sitting immediately to my left. Um, Rachel is bringing to this panel basically the expertise and the kind of media laws that we discussed with Julia during the keynote um, and can talk to us about those as example uh, of what works and doesn't work in transparency law. So to Rachel, from your experience litigating CORA, which is the Colorado Open Records Act, uh, alongside other open government laws in Colorado, what are their benefits? What, is the, what are those laws benefits um, and what are their limitations? Sure. Um, well, thank you for having me um, on this panel. Um, like Margot said, I'm with the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press. Um, we are a nonprofit organization that offers pro bono legal assistance to journalists. Um, and I'm based here under the local legal initiative, um, but it's based in five states. I just had to get that spiel out. Um, but as far as some of the benefits of Cora when I'm um, litigating some of these cases, is one, it certainly holds the government accountable. Um, there's no other law that's, as I would say, as strong as CORA and that's modeled after FOIA um, that ensures that there's accountability for the government for access to information um, that the public and as well, uh, journalists as well, are seeking access to. Um, it's also a, an act that informs um, the public. Um, obviously, a lot of reporters are doing um, really important stories and really important work um, after they are able to get access to records um, from government agencies. And this is local state government agencies. It could be anything like your local school board. Um, it could be, you know, um, the governor's office or the state legislature, um, just the whole gamut of state and local bodies. Um, the other good thing when you get into the nitty gritty, gritty of CORA is that it's a mandatory disclosure statute. So um, it's not, um, you know, narrow like the Colorado Criminal Justice Records Act. Um, under CORA, usually the government has to disclose 
information or records to an individual unless an exception applies. And there's many more exceptions under CORA than there are for FOIA. FOIA, um, I believe, just has nine exceptions and CORA has many exceptions. And that's usually the case for a lot of state laws. Um, so there's a lot of good benefits in knowing that when you request information, it is your information um, and you should be entitled to it. Um, and one of the limitations I think of CORA certainly from, you know, litigating some of these cases from, uh, you know, a, a journalistic uh, lens is that um, if you are denied access to a record in Colorado, the only way to get access to it is to litigate. Um, you can't, there's really no appellate um, body or board that will review the denial from the government before deciding to release the record. You actually have to go into court and ask the court to um, give you access to this record. Um, so as you could imagine, um, it, it can get quite expensive to litigate in court to get access to these records. And um, I think that's one of the limitations for sure. Thank you so much. Sure. Um, as a follow-on question, is there room in your experience to use open government laws like CORA uh, or like the CCJRA or like the Colorado Open Meetings Law to get transparency not just into government but into practices of the private sector? You know, that's a tough. That's a tough um, question. I'm, I'm, I'm. We were talking about this a little bit earlier, and I think you know, there's certainly a way that private companies can use Quora to get information, because um, really anyone can use Quora to get information. Um, but when you talk about Quora, it's very specific to access to access um, to government information. Um, so you know the way a public record is defined as any record that's made, maintain, made, maintained, or kept for use um, by a state agency or a local agency in the functions of what they do every day. Um, so it's very challenging, you know, to look at that from a from a private um, lens. Although I have had a couple of cases where the state government will use, you know, like an outside vendor that is a private company to um, maintain certain information like the Secretary of State's office has this tracer database where you're able to access campaign finance information um, and a third party, you know, through a contract with the Colorado State Secretary of State's office, they'll, they'll, they'll contract with that private party to maintain that information. And if you do request that information, they're in charge of disclosing it to you. But typically, um, it's, it's just not a privacy <laughs> statute whatsoever. It's, it's, it's more holding state and local bodies accountable, unfortunately. Sure. Um, and then I think the last two quick questions I had for you. One is, uh, could you talk a little bit more about your least favorite exceptions? So like, what oh, are the sure. worst exceptions to Cora? Um, sure. And the follow-on question to that is going to be, should Cora be a model for laws, transparency laws, targeting, say, the private sector? Sure. So I have many exceptions that just not me, I guess. They should not journalists a little bit more than me. But um, there's one exception. It's called the personnel files exception under Cora. And basically what it says is that um, if there are any records related to the uh, home address, um, other personal information related to an individual, so like their phone number, um, some financial information, and then there's a section of it that says um, any information that's made or maintained um, in the employer-employee relationship, that is a very, very narrow exception. It primarily means that like, you know, a gover uh, uh, an individual could not get access to someone's personal identifying information, you know, related to those things, your home address, your phone number, et cetera. But a lot of agencies use this um, exception to bar disclosure of records that should be um, disclosed to you. Like if you wanna get disciplinary records of um, a principal at, at, in the Denver Public Schools or an individual um, public official, um, they'll use that exception to, to not deny access um, to a lot of, um, you know, journalists and just in public individuals. Um, the other exception that is really tricky is the sexual harassment complaints and investigation section of Quora. And that is really um, interpreted by courts as being very broad. 
and usually it prohibits disclosure of any information related to potential um, violations um, from government officials. Um, and one example I use is, um, you know, Governor Cuomo of New York, uh, he faced sexual harassment allegations and there was a, a report uh, related to whether or not those allegations had any validity. And that entire report was disclosed, unredacted. In Colorado, um, a similar case happened um, with um, an individual who was the president of the school board, Denver School Board, and uh, reporters I was working with sought access to that record, and they were denied under this exception um, to the almost the exact same report. Um, a lot of, I mean, they, they actually got access to the report, but there were so many redactions that they couldn't see anything. And the court basically held that, you know, any record of sexual complaints um, or investigations will not be disclosed. And it's so broadly interpreted that you can't get any information. Um, I mean, not great. That's awful. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, um, so, so I'm going to extrapolate a little bit from uh, your descriptions of the law uh, to again say, like, this is the shape of Cora, right? The shape of Cora is a journalist or somebody files a request mm -hmm. and either gets a "here's your info" or we deny it. And in that process, there might be an identification of we deny it under this particular one of 75 exceptions. Um, and then one thing I heard you say earlier that I did not know that was interesting was that the only way to then go after them is through court. Are there other open records laws in other states where there is a sort of appellate system that lowers the expense of challenging the exceptions? Um, there are, I mean, actually a majority of courts or a majority of states do have that appellate level. I think Texas has this appellate level um, decision-making um, and I believe a couple other states that my colleagues are in, I want to say Tennessee and potentially Pennsylvania have that appellate access, if I'm, I could be wrong. Um, but those are states where you do have that board that will take a look at your denial before you have to litigate in court. And Oklahoma and Colorado have the same exception where you have to immediately litigate before you can get access to a record if you're denied. So a lot of people are just negotiating with a custodian at that point saying, can I have a little bit of information? Mm -hmm. You know, can I have access to some of this? Um, and, you know, it's typically, it's typically still just a challenge. Yeah. So I guess in, in answering the, the other question that I had posed about, should this be the model? I think Cora is actually a very effective statute. You know, if it's, if it's used correctly and if the government follows it correctly, you know, there's no funny business. Um, so I, I think it is a helpful statute, especially when you compare it to the Colorado Criminal Justice Records Act, which is so narrow. Um, you're only gonna get records of official action, which are basically like arrest records or maybe records related to um, um, pro not prohibition, but um, probate information. Um, and any other record under that statute, it could be anything, is up to the custodian's discretion as to whether or not they're gonna disclose it or not. So a lot, I mean, you can get an arrest record, but you can't figure out if an officer has been certified or decertified and what happened. Um, and that's just a huge challenge, I think. So that model, I would say no. <laughs> and I think a lot of folks before I got here have been working on trying to make that a better uh, statute, but Cora, I think it's 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 doing what it should do, except for a couple exceptions. Do you have any questions or thoughts from other panelists before we move? I have a question yeah. about sort of like weaponization and to fall on our earlier panel um, of transparency. So I have some friends in a southern state who work at a public university, and they have been subject to what they feel like at least are harassing FOIA requests regarding their efforts to try to like take down. Um, I think it's take down uh, Confederate monuments, uh, and but sort of like that have blossomed into other things. Uh, I wonder if that's something that you've seen. I also wonder, we have a colleague, David Posen, who has written an article about the, the ideological drift of transparency and how it's sort of like increasingly used for, he says, neoliberal kind of like corporate purposes as opposed to public purposes. Mm -hmm. Like, do you see a lot of companies like doing things to try to like get their competitor under Cora? or are these things not? Um, I, and I hope I'm answering your question correctly. 
Maybe not as maybe not as much. Um, and this and this could relate to what you're talking about. There is this kind of new effort, maybe along the lines of uh, people seeking to ban certain books in libraries. Uh -huh. Right. Exactly. Right. Okay. So you know, I had a reporter who sought access to these requests for reconsideration forms, which are basically forms that allow an individual to go into the library and say, I want you to ban this book. Like, I don't like this book, please take it from our shelves. Um, the problem was is that the individual who requested the removal of the book, their name was redacted. Mm -hmm. um, and there were several individuals who were trying to ban this one particular book. Um, and the reporter was trying to report on that because, yeah. you know, nationally there's been an issue with, um, you know, people saying we don't like you know, critical race theory, we don't like gender queer, that was the name of the book, we want that out of the library. Um, and so that's certainly, CORE is certainly making it a little bit difficult to, yeah. for our journals to get access that way. I think that's, I think that speaks to your question. Yeah. To Amanda's point about the weaponization of open records laws, the other person writing on this is Margaret Quoka, uh, Margaret Quoka, sorry if you can't hear me with the mask, um, who has also similarly said, you know, FOIA, the federal open government law um, ends up becoming a way for uh, companies to basically, you know, flood regulatory agencies with information requests uh, and gum up the works. So there's the weaponization of, you know, you use it, um, you know, against the the university professors who are subject to open records laws uh, to uncover their emails to figure out what they're doing. Don't do that to me. Um, and, <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> no, it's okay. I've been subject to these before. Um, uh, or, you know, and you have companies that are thinking strategically about how do we use the information that regulatory agencies are gathering on our competitors slash how do we gum up the works at a regulatory agency to try to slow it down. So I don't want to make Rachel say the dark side of the open records laws, but that's, that is sort of the, the language around that. Um, all right, so I'm going to turn next to Amanda. Amanda, uh, you have written about the constitutionality of various disclosure regimes, and I know we will probably be hearing about this more from Eric uh, on our third panel as well, from securities regulations to disclosures about deceptive marketing. What are the possible shapes, in your view, of constitutional mandatory disclosures? Uh, and does the First Amendment place any legitimate limits on what mandatory disclosures from companies should look like? Awesome, thank you. Um, thank you all for coming. It's really a delight to be here and thank you for organizing this, it's fantastic. Um, okay, so I thought, one, to tell you, uh, I have, we're very high in the air and there's very little air, so um, that may affect my presentation. Okay, um, uh, so I thought to answer what I think is a really big and important question, one that's like increasingly being litigated today, that um, I would, that it would be helpful for me to lay out the First Amendment law around mandatory disclosures, uh, a little bit about how it's changed over time and what the current dynamics in the courts are um, as a backdrop to my answer um, about what kinds of disclosures, mandatory disclosures should and shouldn't be constitutional today, uh, in part because I know we have like, maybe not all lawyers, we have some students. Um, but a couple points before I get to that. I, um, the First Amendment debate, I think, is often uh, both blunt and confused with policy questions about what governments should do, not what the outer limits of what they could do, and also kind of like to uh, Daphne's earlier point, conflated with what uh, platforms should do or can do. And I think we need to try to disaggregate those things to the extent we can. Um, I'll also say real important questions. There's a number of cases, including the net choice cases, uh, which have essentially it's Texas and uh, Florida's disclosure for um, platform laws. We already have a, a cert petition on one of them. The other one's coming soon. I think certainly the Supreme Court is going to grant cert in those cases. So we're going to get a lot of um, sort of issues around this. Um, and I also want to say you have to bear in mind the constitutional rules are not just about platforms. They're about all these different other forms of disclosure. So things like uh, you know SEC disclosures, nutrition labels, drug interaction disclosures. I mean, you kind of like you name it. Or the thing that says wash your hands in the bathroom. Okay, so it goes uh, far and wide. And I'll say I'm sort of speaking to it with this. You know, we have to think about the broader context in mind, not just the platforms. Okay, so um, the freedom of speech. It says just the freedom of speech. Uh, that can be confusing because for a number of reasons. One, it's like everywhere, 
right? Everything we do could be understood to be expressive. And so, but there's the First Amendment has never protected speech as such or expression as such. Instead, it's sort of like looked at different types of social relationships and institutions. Um, so for example, there's a lot of stuff that you colloquially will call speech that's not at all, it's like there's no First Amendment question. Okay, so for example, uh, y'all have to file taxes. Do you think you have a First Amendment compelled speech claim to say, no, you don't have to file the taxes? No, that's ridiculous. Or, you know, things like conspiracy. I that's <laughs> oh, yeah. conspiracy, right? I have a First Amendment claim. I get to conspire to do whatever. Okay. Or like I got a bad grade in a public school. Well, I get to write whatever I want to, professor. Okay. You get it. So there's a bunch of stuff that's like not even in play that's called uncovered. There's other stuff that we don't call speech, but is covered like art or, you know, music, Mozart, whatever. Okay. Uh, so you get it. The, there's, it's, it's not just all speech and, um, it really is sort of like they're different I, constitutional domains, I guess I'll say. Okay, once you get into stuff that is covered, it doesn't all get the most, the strongest, strictest scrutiny, uh, which I think sometimes people think there's only one First Amendment rule, but that, there are actually many. Okay, so the most important one in play in these types of questions is there's sort of like big rules for political speech or sweet speech in public discourse, and one's largely for commercial speech. So I'm going to talk about those because there's sort of like their interaction really goes to these uh, the heart of a lot of these things. Okay, so uh, the political speech doctrine is mostly, at least a gravamen of it, is for democratic self-governance. Uh, it gets strict scrutiny. Uh, it's protected as an autonomy right. Like for me as a speaker, I get to say what I want. That means that government control efforts to stop me from speaking as opposed to, and compel me to speak are treated the same, right? So like, I can't say don't vote for Trump they say I can't, or they say you have to say the Pledge of Allegiance. Those get the same kind of constitutional treatment because it's about what I can say. Commercial speech, by contrast, has been protected because of the informational interest of the public. So it's not about me speaking, it's about y'all hearing, okay? And um, the court said, like, why is this important? Uh, it said for two reasons. One, because people need information to decide, uh, commercial information, you know, from these trans transparency things, to be able to decide how to vote but also to decide how they want to you know, uh, interact in the economic world and in a world in which we have a market economy, how each of us does things will affect these big questions. Like, do we each wear masks? Do we smoke cigarettes? Do we use fossil fuels, et cetera? Um, okay, uh, there's also an idea in the cases that it's about our ability to live freely in economic life, right? Our ability to get things like drugs that we need to like be full participatory people. Okay, so, what does this mean? There are different standards for compulsions versus uh, restrictions because we want more information to y'all, not less. So that means uh, mandatory disclosures are treated with laxer scrutiny than uh, 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 um, a restriction on speech. Also, it only really protects facts, not opinions, right? Because really what you want to know is facts that can inform what you want to do. Okay, um, so that's sort of like the baseline Recently, there's been a huge movement, which is called new Lochterism by some people, to try to weaponize, <laughs> to try to weaponize the First Amendment uh, in a way to make it much more deregulatory and as like an all-purpose uh, tool. So um, this is maybe even particularly the case in the context of compelled speech. So bunches of companies are like, "You can't me put, make me put on a nutrition label because I don't want you to know my donut has 800 calories." Right? Okay, free speech. Okay, or um, yeah, Exxon says, you can't investigate what I knew about climate change, free speech. Okay, not kidding you. Okay, so um, courts have uh, been struggling with these things, but I think really have moved in this very property protective understanding um, of free speech, and um, which has me meant that there's been less of constitutional space for uh, mandatory disclosures. Um, I think that, uh, so basically the First Amendment has become like a very strong uh, all-purpose deregulatory tool. Um, that might be good, that might be bad, in part because anything can be expressive, right? So it can be used in many different ways. Okay, so that's sort of like been the background trend to what's happening, but we have a new court with new people. Um, so what I just said, I think mostly applies to the Kennedy court. And um, uh, there's a question of like, what's gonna happen now? And I think uh, a really good one about whether or not the new court is going to focus more on the religion clauses 
on uh, the major questions doctrine, as opposed to really using the speech clauses as its like central deregulatory um, tool. Um, I also think that they still want to know about drug interactions for their heart medications, and they don't want to crash markets by you know shutting down the SEC altogether, at least. But you know maybe I'm optimistic. Um, okay, so this is sort of like where um, the background is, and so then I'll really qu quickly say what do I think that means in terms of the space for constitutional uh, mandatory disclosures. Um, I think that uh, that there's like should be a pretty broad space but it should be oriented to these underlying purposes of why we protect commercial speech to begin with, which are a big, you know, a really democratic participatory purposes so that we can have information to vote and to decide how we wanna sort of like live and actually be able to live in our economy. Um, so, and I think disclosures with those things in mind that are factual and accurate uh, generally should be understood to be constitutional. What does that mean? I think a lot of data privacy disclosures should be constitutional. I, but yeah, okay, yeah, totally. I don't, okay, I think that, um, the, you know, the SEC has new climate disclosures. I think those are constitutional. Um, I think, you know, uh, many, many forms of private uh, FOIAs would probably be constitutional, but they're also really uh, important limits to this. And I just wanna flag, I think the biggest ones. One is opinion, right? So the idea is to get facts to the public, not opinion. So I think that, you know, you can't, make a company say, yes, I support this law, or you know, Republicans are great, or whatever. That's not uh, constitutionally permissible. Um, I also, you know, there's also this idea of like editorial discretion. And that's, this goes to a question of like, okay, how are we gonna treat platforms or new types of media, right? Do we think of them more as looking like a newspaper, or do we think them more as looking like a regular company that's being regulated to like send stuff to the SEC? I think they're different, but I think the main thing is we need to not think about disclosures as one thing, but as like in a more line by line way where like, you know, what you do with a, you know, a person doing it versus an algorithm doing it, we might think that that's a different question. Um, okay, uh, the disclosures have to be factual and accurate. Uh, they, and there may also be a question in terms of their implementation about state uh, abuse. I think that that's probably best not get at through curbing transportation uh, transparency rules, but instead about trying to um, really regulate how the, whether or not the government is doing it with an untoward motive. Um, okay, so that's basically what I have, but I wanna say these is where I think the boundaries of the First Amendment are, uh, not what I think is advisable policy either uh, for governments or for private companies. Thank you. I have around 700 questions, but I also want to be mindful of time. Um, that was the most amazing, uh, amazingly succinct outline of extremely complicated case law that I've heard in a long time. So thank you. Um, all right. So we will come back to this. Uh, Brian, I wanted to turn to you next. So Brian, your work and your lab's work on the role of technology in enabling resilience among people, particularly marginalized people, often focuses on platform design and the ways in which the affordances of platforms, the sort of shapes of platforms play a role uh, in enabling or preventing such resilience. So to target this through a transparency related question, what does well-designed transparency look like from a design perspective when you're talking about enabling your users to protect themselves in the way that you study? Yeah, and so can, can people hear me okay with this mask? Okay. So I also want to thank everyone for coming here. I'm going to start, I kind of want to start this conversation with a bit of a background about myself and the work so that I can then situate transparency and context. Um, and so just to give you a sense of my own positionality and my identities that sort of brought me into the exploration of resilience as a phenomenon. So I am a first generation American. Um, my parents fled war, like various wars in Iraq. Um, and immigrate so like as refugees to the United States were members of the indigenous population of Iraq. So is anyone here familiar with Assyrians, Chaldeans? That's what I am. We're not we're not very well we're not very well known. Um, but but all of these experience uh, all these experiences as someone in between these two social worlds of like being an American and an Iraqi have given me this sort of like experience of always been in between in this like liminal state of trying to figure out what the heck I am and how this world and this universe works. Um, and so in those experiences, um, I went I, and I went and I trained as a, a traditional computer scientist 
who was learning programming and algorithms and all of that other fun stuff. Um, and in all of that work, I kept thinking and seeing more and more that technology was doing a lot of bad too. And so, and so we often think, oh, technology is like this thing that can save the world. But on the other hand, it's also doing a lot of bad. And so, and so in that, my work really focuses on that relationship between where it can be this very pro-social positive force in the world, but also this very negative um, thing that people are just experiencing by virtue of how it has been designed, constructed, created, by whom it is being created, for whom it is being created. Um, and so my work has, has focused very heavily on how people draw on technology as a resource to build resilience. And so in this, in, by resilience, I'm really referring to how people build um, like resistance or bounce back from vulnerability or threat. And so, you know, in drawing on my, in drawing on my experiences, my initial sort of research in this area, I'm really focused on people living through war and specifically the second Gulf War in Iraq and how they were drawing on technology to build resilience. And then over time, my work started to focus on transitions and people who experienced these life, life phase transitions moving to another status or condition. And so I've been looking a lot at, so I looked at a lot of refugees, veterans, um, trans, you know, trans communities. And then more recently, my work for the past decade has really focused explicitly on those at the margins and who are made vulnerable just by virtue of being born black, Latinx, um, you know, queer, et cetera. Um, and so in, in that work, um, in, in that work and in the, like in my work and in the work of others, one area that we've really started to hone in on in the context that's related to transparency is algorithms. Right, and so when I think of algorithms, I'm really thinking about these black box systems or artifacts that underlie social, social, like technical systems that shape a lot of our everyday experiences. So if you are using anything from Facebook to TikTok, there is an algorithm that is doing something behind the scenes that shapes how you experience that system and also your day-to-day -day life, right? And so, and so more famously, like these algorithms can control our beliefs, our assumptions, about things like they can determine who gets a job, um, how long people will remain in prison or who, you know, or how long you know, for like sentencing and things like that. Um, and so as a scholar who reflects on transparency more broadly through those experience, for experiences with people at the margins, um, I think it's really important to then talk about how um, the kinds of harm a lack of transparency can produce. Right, and so, and a lot of this comes through how these systems are designed, right? So like when I'm thinking about an algorithm that predicts sentencing, there is a more famous example um, where, where depending, so like, so how, how many of you have seen this example in the more contemporary media that illustrated how these, these um, sentencing algorithms, if they, if, when they are given two people where one person is a white man who has committed like, like more horrific acts than say a black man, it'll have like a two year sentence requirement as opposed to like a nine year sentence. And so these things often reiterate and they perform a very racist set of logics. And, and, but it's not very clear how those things work. And in my own work, I've looked at a lot of this through, the, through, the, through two specific platforms. And um, so TikTok and also Reddit. Um, and for a brief moment, I want to talk about, you know, in the context of how Reddit is perpetuating harm through this lack of transparency, or, or sorry, TikTok, how TikTok is, per, is perpetuating harm through the lack of transparency. My grad student colleague and I, Ellen Simpson, conducted a study looking at LGBTQ plus um, community members and their use of TikTok. And through this study, we were talking to people about how they're experiencing the platform. And if you're not familiar with TikTok, TikTok has a For You page which is mediated by an algorithm. So an algorithm called the For You, For you page algorithm really tries to learn about the users on the platform. So like through your clicks, through what you're watching, through what you're engaging with, it will then present material to a user. And it really tries to like put people into buckets. And so on the one hand, it has representation, right? So there's representation, there, there was queer representation, people were seeing themselves reflected in a lot of this material. But then when you start to intersect different identities, what we started to see more and more is that you could be queer, but you can only be a very specific kind of queer. 
right? So you could be you could be a white you could be a white woman lesbian, but you could not be a black woman lesbian, right? Because the content and the videos produced by black women were being was being erased. Right. And so through some of the work that we when we started talking to some of the designers, we learned that they actually had very specific criteria that was given to them as policy by TikTok, which this is verbatim. I'm not making this up. It said if people are fat, ugly, black, like etc., you should remove those videos. Right. And this was we started studying TikTok when it really started to make make the mainstream here in the, in the US. Um, and so, you know, on the one hand, I can say, you know, F you big tech, like you really pissed me off. Um, and, and as many as many people should be questioning a lot of what big tech is up to. Um, I also think that we have to count, we have to couch our response in the context of what I'm referring to as like a transparency cost. Because when we're getting into when we're getting into how design is accomplished in um, formal settings like making things transparent actually is oftentimes in conflict with the incentive structures of industry right so like who so like let's say i want data to go and understand transparency or like the lack of transparency like at, at a corporate institution who's actually going to generate that data for me um where's that going to come from so like what structures really exist around that um and so and so I think, and I think the other thing that I want to mention is even in situations where like as a computer scientist and understanding somewhat how algorithms work, like people who study neural networks, as an example, even if they have full control over all of the variables, they ultimately don't know why those neural networks present what they do, right? So like that, the, even transparency at the design level and the creator level is very, it's not that clear. Um, and also, how much time do I have left? I should ask. Three-ish. Three-ish. Okay. So, so I think so. I think I wanted to kind of like situate that transparency cost in like two two examples that I think are very important. And I'm going to come back to dating apps for a moment. How many of you have used a dating app? Right. And so, so I was at the I often so I often attend a conference called the the SIGCHI. It's the human it's the hu human computer interaction conference which is like a big design conference in my community. And one year we had the pleasure or the displeasure of, of having a keynote given to us by one of the co-founders of OkCupid. Um, and in this talk, the founder of one of the co-founders of OkCupid was describing how they're using data to, to, re, to, re, um, to like constantly evolve the interface of OkCupid. Right. And so like initially when OkCupid started, it was much more like a match.com interface where it was like more about depth of a profile and you could go and like learn about somebody before swiping left or right. Right. And they saw over time that more, most people were spending a few moments on a profile and just making a decision. Right. Which led them through that data driven perspective to believe that people were only basing it off of looks. Um, and so they decided to then reorient, restructure their entire interface around that premise of left and right, you know, swiping. Um, and then this is where it got super disgusting. He made the comment that we also learned through that data-driven analysis that white men did not like black women and that we, are, we eliminated all black women from, this, the feed of white, from the feeds of white men. Okay, so that's like, you know, that was like pretty devastating and there was a huge uproar at this conference. And this is a case where transparency becomes like increasingly important. Like, you know, the, making that kind of data and those decisions and the values available to people so they can understand how that is made, made, being implemented. But another case of a dating app, and I can't speak to this because it's from a study. I mean, so I'm gonna call it from platform X. So, and so platform X is part of their design. They needed to, they were really thinking about, well, like in a dating app, you're really trying to get people to establish a meaningful connection as, a, as opposed to like a hookup app. And so they're really trying to create like a dating app in this case. And what they ended up talking about was they were using the metaphor of a bar. And they wanted to, and they said like when people go to a bar, like you stay at a bar for a while and like you might interact with some people and you might, you know, you might miss out or what happens, but you're there for a while. 
And so they're really thinking about like this engagement around keeping people sustained with the platform until they found a meaningful connection. And one of the ways in which they were implementing that was they said they started to assign people with beauty levels. And depending on their beauty level, they would always show people, people like other people to them that were above their level, so to speak, so that they would like maintain interest until they established a meaningful connection. Um, so that's just more of like a provocation of like, do I, would I want to know what my beauty level is? Probably like hell, hell no. Um, but, <laughs> but there, but there's like some, you know, so, <laughs> so I don't want to know that. Right. So, so this kind of getting into this, like this really illustrates the complexities of transparency in the context of design. And I really believe that I like, can order to real, to like, to realize this goal of transparency in the design process and the design context. It really has to become a value that's integrated into that process from a, in a very formal way. Um, and so it's going to really require like a transformation because like oftentimes a lot of, a lot of technology is designed outside of policy. Right. And so like, I think, I think this has to be a larger holistic collaboration between policymakers, designers, law, et cetera, et cetera. Um, while also taking into account the costs of transparency. And we should be asking questions around transparency for whom transparency when transparency at what level um, and these and the policy should also empower people and so I, I really think that part of this is in my class and i'll end with the final like in my classes i teach a lot of design courses one of the things that i always champion is that if we actually had if we actually gave voice and agency to people at the margins and actually having like a like you know real active discourse in how things are constructed that the world would be a better place Thank you so much. Um, I know this is a live conversation in the field of algorithmic accountability in terms of how to how to legally structure potentially that kind of uh, stakeholder and impacted individual engagement. Um, so I'm definitely excited to talk more about this. Um, to my two subject access request people, uh, I'm going to ask you guys to each try to do around seven minutes so we can get to discussion. Um, First, we have Jeff. Uh, Jeff, you're working in European data protection law, and you've done this work on subject access requests, disclosing how individual transparency rights can work sometimes. We heard this in the conversation with Julie, uh, Julia, uh, on shedding light on bigger societal and governance problems. So what are subject access rights? What are the limitations? Uh, and how might they be improved potentially as a tool to get oversight over the whole system as opposed to just oversight for individual people. Right, thanks, Margot. Can everybody hear me like that? If I take a bit of a distance, yeah. So uh, first of all, thanks also for having me over. Uh, it's a great discussion so far. I enjoyed the panels and, and the keynote a lot, uh, especially coming from Europe uh, to get more of this uh, American perspective. Um, but I'm, I'm here as a token European, so I'll be giving more of a <laughs> you know, like a European, <laughs> European perspective. Um, and so for my intervention, I, I really want to uh, 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 talk about, you know, like, or focus on the, the positives of, of these data access rights uh, in the GDPR and increasingly also in other legal instruments in the EU and how they are challenged in practice. Um, but perhaps first, let me take a st step back and uh, uh, very briefly look at the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation as a whole, which is often framed uh, in, in Europe, in the US, as a privacy regulation. And I mean, some of you may know uh, <laughs> um, that one of my pet peeves is to, uh, to, to, to say that that is not uh, the case. It's not a privacy regulation at all. Um, it's really about infusing fairness, transparency, and, and autonomy into data infrastructures, uh, safeguarding all rights, freedoms, or interests uh, as they are affected by these data infrastructures and those controlling those infrastructures, obviously. So concretely, this basically means that, you know, these data rights that the GDPR gives to, to individuals, a right of access, right to erasure, right to object, right to data portability, they're useful for protecting my privacy, sure, but also for protecting my free speech, uh, non-discrimination, my integrity, uh, and so on. And there's a growing number of actual real life cases, uh, real life initiatives where these rights are indeed used for these different purposes. Uh, so to better understand credit scoring algorithms, for example, or to challenge all kinds of different types of recommender systems, 
or to support workers' uh, rights uh, in, in the platform or in the gig, gig uh, economy context. Um, or indeed also to expose discriminatory practices in college admissions, right? So these are all situations where it's not really about the privacy of individuals, uh, but more like exposing and challenging injustices. Um, all right, so looking at transparency and data access in, in particular now, uh, these are themes that run throughout the GDPR that are actually also part of the charter of fundamental rights in the EU. And they're also a recurring theme uh, throughout this avalanche of recent EU legislation uh, on technology. Uh, so I'm gonna spare you the details on that. So in the GDPR, um, the key provision here is Article 15 on the rights uh, of access, which gives you uh, the rights to obtain a copy of all of your personal data and personal data is interpreted very, very broadly. Uh, and then some, right? So a copy of your data plus a whole bunch of metadata, which is often forgotten. You know, where did the data come from? Who was it shared with? How long is it stored for? Uh, what exact purposes is each data point used for? And so on. And then there's a whole bunch of modalities that, is, that are specified by the GDPR. You know, it should be easy to exercise. The information that comes back should be intelligible. Um, it should be free of charge. There's a one month uh, time limit uh, and so on. A key feature that makes these access rights so uh, useful uh, is that they are intent agnostic. You don't need to motivate why you're exercising this right. And this makes them very multifunctional, uh, especially when you're exercising them in a more strategic and collective uh, manner. Uh, so for example, to, to expose what I, was talking about before, you know, systematic or systemic issues uh, such as discrimination. A clear example uh, is, is in the gig work context. Uh, I can talk about that later in the Q&A uh, if you want. There's been uh, some big cases in the Netherlands against Uber and Ola, uh, two gig uh, work platforms, uh, on specifically using access rights to expose these uh, algorithmic management systems. Now, one concrete instance where access rights also show a lot of potential uh, uh, and are increasingly used is in investigative research. Uh, we've seen the, the talk by uh, Julia Angwin, uh, so for journalists, but also, of course, for academics. Because from talking with a lot of uh, social scientists, especially, you know, researchers are increasingly struggling to observe the world uh, around them as it's increasingly digitized and privatized. And so if you want to understand, you know, education, work, transportation, social practices, we, we simply need to be able to observe the digital infrastructures on which that these things are largely taking place today. And so the impact of lockdowns on dating life or working habits or the impact of political micro-targeting on polarization, you know, these are all issues uh, uh, that we need access to uh, information, uh, to data uh, for. So to me, these data access provisions, this discourse is not just vital to hold platforms accountable. That's an important component, but it's increasingly also necessary to, to just understand society and to do science and journalism. And so, yeah, a brief point also that, it, it, that worth mentioning is that this emerging work on so-called data donations, that was also referred to by Julia, uh, this really a big, uh, a growing field in, in Europe, especially where people you know, can agree to give some of their data under certain conditions uh, to researchers. Um, all right, so briefly now, uh, talk about the issues and challenges. Um, specifically, there's quite some challenges with the interpretation, application, and enforcement of these access rights. And so first of all, these access rights are formulated in a very broad and vague manner. And the reason for that is that it's it's useful for a very broad and wide applicability. The flip side of that is that it pushes interpretation costs downstream. And this means that in practice, already powerful actors, whether it's industry or government bodies, uh, they very much set the tone on how these laws are interpreted and applied in practice. And this is evident time and again, in, I've done plenty of empirical research projects uh, over the years on uh, looking at uh, access rights compliance and, and, and time and again, it's, it's very clear that, you know, there's a, 
a very narrow interpretation and application of these provisions in practice. And so this vague phrasing also is yeah, very far removed from the practical realities where these rights can be most valuable. And I very much appreciated your uh, 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 talk just now, Brian. Um, you know, people that need, arguably need these rights the most, that are most impacted by these data infrastructures uh, from like marginalized communities, exploited workers, asylum seekers, any, any kind of vulnerable person that is affected by these digital infrastructures, um, they generally have no real meaningful access to these rights. And so the coordination of these data rights may help overcome to some extent, you know, these, these, uh, the accessibility of these rights, but raises a whole bunch of uh, concerns and questions too. You know, who is the coordinator? Is it a for-profit entity, for example? What happens to the data if it is pooled? Uh, how are the identities of individuals verified uh, and so on. And well, yeah, then there's a whole bunch of uh, enforcement issues that I could get into, but maybe let's keep that for the, for the Q&A then, uh, if there's an interest. Thank you so much. Um, so finally to Andrea, uh, you're the other side of the coin on the subject access requests. You get to tell us what goes on inside companies when they receive these things. Uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly? <laughs> Yeah, no, so thank you for having me. I th I'm very honored to be the, the company side of all of this. Um, and I take that not lightly at all. So before I, you know, actually answer the question, I think some background is in order and some of my own observations working with dozens and dozens and dozens of companies over the past years. You know, I think when we develop privacy laws and we talk about privacy, oftentimes we are posing the corporation as the big evil, right? So. You know, they're doing all of these bad things. They are misusing data. You know, they're horrible, horrible things. I do not disagree that there are bad actors. Absolutely. There are companies who are doing things with data that should have never been done in the first place. But I have never once worked with a company who were on a call and they're like, hey, 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 hey I have all this data. I'm so excited to use it incorrectly, right? Most of them are honestly trying so hard to do the right thing. But we're all fighting an uphill battle here because the CEOs, the board of directors, the people with the money, they haven't jumped on the privacy bandwagon. So what's happening is we have all these huge laws that are really complex, that are multi-jurisdictional, coming in and you have to do all of this stuff to do the right thing and there's no money. There's absolutely no money, there's no resources. So they're under-resourced, they're under budgeted. And I think that plays into the transparency aspect because in order to effectively respond to an access request, there is so much that has to go into it. A company needs to, first of all, have a perfectly clear and absolutely cr crystal clear view of their data, right? They need to know what data do they have? Where is it? Who is it shared with? When is it used? Why is it used? For big companies who have been collecting data for many, many years, this is no small task. This isn't like looking at three or four spreadsheets. This is looking at multiple countries, multiple databases, multiple people's file cabinets, which isn't a bad thing. I think that all companies should do this, and this is step one. But that's a, that's a project that costs no less than 50,000 for a small company. I've seen it go up to a half a million. Right, And when you're talking about companies that don't have a budget, that's a big chunk of change to do it right. Okay, so we've got this fine, you know, let's have our hypothetical company have a perfectly clear view of all of their data. Now they have to sift through the data and start pulling out the things that shouldn't be disclosed, maybe because there's third party implications, maybe because there's trade secrets. Perhaps there's some data that is actually gonna pose more risk to the company than it would be to not comply, which isn't necessarily the right thing, but it's a reality, right? Like we're all talking about business risk here. Am I actually airing my dirty laundry so that I can get sued for you know, employment discrimination? Which again, isn't necessarily a bad thing that they should be transparent about that. But is that the reality of what you're getting going back to the interpretation of corporations? So we've got you know, all of these hurdles that we have to get through. And then at the end, we have to produce something to the requester. And part of the difficulty that companies are facing is what is the purpose of these requests, right? Like if I go to 
Acme Corporation, I say, give me all the data that you have about me. Why am I asking for this? If it's a fishing expedition or a research expedition, okay, fine. Like you actually do want a spreadsheet, but like as a consumer, do I really want 400 pages of metadata? What, what am I really trying to understand here? And so I think on a personal level, one of my issues is that many governments, AGs, people who are passing these laws pose it as, you know, this is good for the consumer to control their data. But like, what am I controlling when I'm putting forth an access request? If we're being honest about it, it's a way to hold companies accountable. It's not for me necessarily to understand what data there is about me. It could be, right? Maybe I do want to know what I bought from the grocery store five years ago on April 2nd. I don't know, maybe. But like, am I going to find that in the 400 page document that I'm getting back? I'm not sure. So, you know, I think to answer your question, transparency from the corporate side is the right way to go. But we've got a long way before we can get there. And unfortunately, enforcement is coming faster than we can get the money to get it done. And so that's why companies are concerned, right? Like they want to do the right thing, but they can't in many cases. Thank you so much. Um, so I think at this point, it's appropriate to open up to questions from you all uh, and also to the, from the panelists to each other. So if you want to raise your hands, I will call on you too. Uh, but once again, the Phil Weiser rule rules. And do I have a student who would like to start us off? Khalif. Oh, hold on one second. We need to get you a microphone. Hold on. Hi, uh, thanks a lot for this amazing panel. Uh, my question is mostly directed at Andrea. Um, given the difficulty for companies to actually come up with this perfect system whereby they can implement all of these rules and still be profitable, and they don't want to air out their dirty laundry accidentally, whatever, what is the, like, how do we strike the right balance between transparency, consumer rights, and sure, like profit? Just a small question, Andrea. It's, <laughs> <laughs> um, if I knew that, maybe I'd be a governor. Um, but, you know, I think it's a, it's a really good question and something that the market is trying to figure out right now, right? So we do benchmarking and we look at what all of the different companies are doing. What types of documents are you getting in response to access requests? So, you know, if you survey 40 different companies, what are you getting back? And we see it all over the map. I think the, the interpretation comment is spot on, right? We have some companies who are giving you one page responses with only the stuff that you know you've submitted, right? Your name, your email address, your phone number. And I'm like, great, I know you have more than that on me. But then I've also actually seen a 300 page Excel spreadsheet line by line that is absolutely unintelligible to anyone except for like an aerospace engineer. Um, and I think what we're going to see is two things. One, the market is going to start to center and hone in on a specific way of treating access requests. And I think that we will see regulators come in and give guidance on whether it is or is not appropriate. You know, we have a lot more guidance from Europe than we do from, say, California, obviously, any of the new states. Um, and then I think the second thing that we're going to see is more, we're going to see more automation, more technologies come in and to help companies get there. Because right now, a lot of this is manual, right? Like, you have a three-person IT team and a two-person marketing team, and together they are trying to cobble together some access request for a law that frankly they don't understand and never could because it's too complicated. So as you get more technologies that do understand the law, they understand what has to happen, that along with the market center centering, I think will give us a more clear path forward. So I have a, an interim question and then we have a question over there from Daphne. Um, which is, you know, one way to potentially thread the needle I think runs into uh, Amanda's First Amendment landscape, which is, you know, instead of asking, hey, hand over all the data, you say, tell me what it is that you're doing. Like, produce this new information. It's not just the facts you have about me, but it's the explanation of what the algorithm is doing. Um, and so I wonder, you know, both from a, to both of you, to each of you, and actually I guess to Brian also, to Andrea, uh, is that preferable from a company standpoint uh, in its sort of efficiency? Uh, or is it, you know, regulatorily confusing. Um, to Amanda, 
does that raise a different set of First Amendment problems than just hand over the facts that you have about this individual? Um, and to Brian, you know, when you're thinking about transparency and its pros and cons from the perspective of a user, um, the tension and ex explanation is really how understandable is it to the user versus how useful is it at like actually uncovering the issues that you referenced? I don't have a preference on order, so any of you can. Um, so I was actually thinking about something very similar earlier when I was determining what I was going to say. Um, and, you know, one of the, the solutions that I've always thought might be helpful from a consumer standpoint is to be like, I want this category of information about me. Because if I do want my receipts from the grocery store, it would be so much easier to just ask for the darn receipts, right, rather than get a 300-page metadata. But at the same time, my clients hate doing category requests. Mm. They would rather just produce all of the data because it's very difficult for untrained employees because, again, a lot of these legal teams are two people and they have every other type of legal issue to work with. They can't discern what is a certain category, right? Like, what is internet activity? Like, what falls within it? So it creates more questions than it does responses. And so if we were to say, like, what are you doing with the information? I think it would be really hard right now because it's, the laws are so new and they're so complicated that unless you are doing privacy every day, like you may not even understand what the, what the task is. Like you'd have to be so clear and the regulations would have to be so precise for that to work. Yeah, I'm sure you're doing this to the open government attorney thinking like she definitely has an opinion about yeah. this. Um, so I'm adding you to the queue also. Uh, so Amanda or Brian? Or also, Rachel, if you need to yeah. talk. <laughs> <laughs> right. no, I'm, I'm formulating a response because, uh, go ahead, Amanda. Okay, well, <laughs> so, so, this is a, so, okay, so your question is a really important one because it, it's also coming up uh, in the SEC context now about the climate disclosure rules. It's it, The idea is not just sort of like, here are my, you know, uh, like statistics of how much carbon, but also here are my plans to try to deal with it. And, you know, is that a fact or is that an opinion? I certainly think it's a fact, like this is what you are doing, okay? But the companies, uh, I suspect, will argue that, you know, that, that that's an opinion or should be understood to be an opinion or it's too speculative to possibly be a fact. Uh, and there are all these... There are all these uh, interesting, hard, and really important questions about how we should think about, like, factiness, right? Especially in the context of scientific, when we're talking about risks and uncertainties or just like, you know, normal accounting principles, right? All these things have built in, you know, mathematical assumptions. Are those assumptions a form of uh, opinion, right? If, you, if it's not 100% going to happen, does that make it an opinion? Uh, I think the answer has to be no if we're going to have, just because the nature of science has some uncertainty baked into it. Um, otherwise, we're going to have, and why on earth would we want the Constitution to be like, midi, like being the one deciding these issues? So, um, yeah. So I think something like that, like what's our uh, policy, can be disclosed. But I think there, especially when you get into the platforms and content moderation, at some point you're going to hit like, is this editorial discretion in another way? But if it's not known to be editorial discretion, like I'm just manipulating people without them knowing, the thing about a newspaper, you know it's a newspaper and it's gonna give you an opinion. The thing of when you go on Facebook and you're like, they're moving you around, I, I don't know. Okay, so yeah. I, I'm inclined to think so more things like are facty. How facty is it, facty being an official word derived at this conference, um, how facty is it uh, and, and also like how transparent is the platform being about whether or not this is an opinion might actually be part of yeah. the legal construction of is it a fact? Brian, and then Rachel, you are totally on the queue. Because so, not, not to take up not to take up too much time, I, I wanted to like very briefly comment on so like whenever I'm thinking about data driven like decision making, right? I think this is more like to I think one of one of the points you made around like there's these like small teams of people that have to like make sense of a ton of data. And it's a very and it's a very complex and difficult problem, but one thing that I often think gets ignored when we consider transparency, because everyone's talking about like transparency about the data, but what about transparency around what's missing from the data, yeah. right? Because this is like whenever I'm talking about like I I teach I used to teach a class on data and society, and one of the things that I went through was the data science model that people are using to like 
um, you know, make decisions in organizations or do all this other work, but I often say like, where does the data come from? Who created that data? Under what assumptions was this data created? What is missing from that data, right? There's like a lot of different ways in which we can like think about transparency there. And, and you know, and who's being power, or who's given power or privilege through that data? Um, and then also the people that are doing the data-driven work, how are their values then shaping and meeting what they're seeing in that? Yeah. Right, and then that then impacts the people on the other end in a very severe and ser like serious way. Yeah, I'm completely forgetting the name of it, but it's like the data origins report, right? Or the like, um, uh, yeah. And and you know, this too is part of the conversation about transparency and algorithmic accountability. Of you know, where do you put in place recording and reporting requirements that could again create these facts, right? Uh, or establish the internal records that then could be used externally. Um, so, Rachel, my question to you, listening to uh, uh, to Andrea. Talk about how hard it is to receive specific requests versus the data dump request. Mm -hmm. Do you see this in the government context as well? Well, I I think it's very different from the obviously the government context is is quite a bit different from the private sector context. And you know, one thing that journalists will ask me or they have to think about before um, submitting a, a request is, you know, does the government need to know what I'm going to do with this information? And, you know, the response is no. I mean, that's your information. You don't have to justify why you want that information. Um, you should be able to get it. It's related to you as a taxpayer. You're paying um, monies, you know, for the government to collect this information. Um, I had one case a little bit off track a little bit. Um, I had one case where a reporter was trying to get access to that tracer database. And he was told in order to get access to this database, it's going to cost thousands of dollars for, you know, the, the folks who are maintaining the database to get that information to them. And it, if you really think about that, that's like taxpayers dollars. So it's like the journalist is paying for the information that he's eventually going to get access to. Um, and I mean, it is a little bit different in the private, obviously, in, versus the government sector is because, you know, this is work that the journalist is doing in the public interest. Um, so, you know, if it's a consumer looking at getting access to this data, it could be for a very different reason. Um, but the other thing with, you know, a journalist getting access to metadata, um, that is data that has to be disclosed under Quora, that is a public record. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, if, if a reporter is a data reporter and they want to get that metadata information, they're going to know how to use it and manipulate it to make it make sense to the public. Um, so, you know, if you get a data dump, they're like, that's fine. Just yeah. give me the data. It's okay. I'll figure it out. Um, so it doesn't matter what category that they receive the information in. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry, I hijacked the Q&A. So we have uh, Daphne, and I'm going to go five minutes late on this so you all have warning so we can have more questions. Thank you. Um, this is building on the points that Andrea made about um, the internal storage systems being messy and difficult, and so it's expensive to pull all of the data that makes up like a user's profile. Um, and I'm curious, you know, the, the kind of surveillance capitalism critique of platforms is they have all this data, they can or are perfectly targeting us, you know, they are using the data in the most um, rationalized, scary way possible. Um, and if that's not the case now, if right now they're storing it in a messy way where they could use it, aggregate it, but they're not into some beautiful profile of each of us, do, is there anything in the law that you guys work on or the practices you guys work on that would tell us, like, when do we want to keep it messy or do we never want to keep it messy um, because, the, because of the transparency goals, et cetera? Yes, Jeff. Let me um, let me try and reiterate to make sure that I'm understanding correctly. Are you saying from the corporate's perspective, is there is there any incentive to keep messy databases? Sorry, I'm asking from the public policy perspective, do we want laws to drive those databases to become very clean so you really can do individual mm. profiling on people much better? Um, so I think I think it's I have an answer, but I'm not sure that it's going to answer exactly what you're asking. So I think personally, and also from a corporate perspective, um, 
I, I do think that, a lot, that the laws should be pushing to have cleaner data, right? Like have your data in centralized areas, understand what you have, where you have it, and why you have it, right? I, I don't think that it's in anyone's interest, including the companies, to have these databases in unknown places with unknown information, right? It poses a huge risk to the company to have a bunch of employees from 20 years ago, all of their HR records in an unknown database that can be breached, right? And then all of a sudden you have a huge problem. I think that where the privacy laws are going from a data mapping perspective is probably the right direction. And I think from a public policy standpoint, you know, maybe perhaps the concern is that having cleaner databases will create more advanced profiles, right? Because you now know what, where, what you have, where it is, et cetera. But in, in conjunction with creating data mapping its incentives, all of the laws are also creating incentives not to use like large advertising. And frankly, a lot of the big platforms such as Google are starting to um,